Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to the Groveland Council on Aging monthly men's breakfast. Um, today, May, this is the last breakfast until we start back up again in October. So we wanted to have a really excellent speaker for you for our grand finale for the end of the year. Um, but more about that in a second. I wanted to let you know we have a program coming uh, that I think you fellas might be interested in on June 24th at 1 p.m. here in the big room. It's gonna be on electrical safety. Um, we have a gentleman coming, uh, Mr. Goulet, who does a, a great program. He's got raffle prizes, and it's gonna be an ice cream social for free that's sponsored by the Groveland Light Department. So, so that's, that'll be, I think, fun to come to and really informative. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to and welcome Gus Roosh with a program on Wisdom of the Elders. Thank you very much, Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, I didn't think I was going to get here today. I'm from Bradford, and I was coming up Gardner Street, and a school bus was in front of me, and the mother came out of the house, and the boy took off. Didn't want to get on the bus. <laughs> I went around and around and around the bus. And everyone was you know, clapping and it, it was very funny. Who won? Then, who, oh, the mother won. <laughs> she was about 6'5", so you know, he was about, well, he didn't want to get on that bus and it's almost the end of the school year. I didn't understand that at all. But it was kind of funny. It, but until, the door opened and the little sister came out of the house all by herself. Boy, if traffic were going by, that would have been the end of her. Yeah. So it was kind of... Um, my wife showed me my horoscope for yesterday. I'm going to be 80 years old in August. And the first word on my horoscope for yesterday was Lots of romance, <laughs> lots of romance, 80 years old. But it was kind of strange because I went to Sarah's place. I go to Sarah's place twice a month over in Haverhill for the, for the elderly. And I had a lot of romance because almost all the people there were women. So I had a harem there yesterday. <laughs> but then they said my, uh, I was gonna get stronger. I would have lots of energy yesterday, so. So it was kind of funny. Uh, last fall, I gave a course over at Northern Essex Community College. I gave a number of courses, so lifelong learners. Uh, I enjoy doing that, it's a, it's a lot of fun. They wanted something different last fall. So I came up with something that I found at home. It's called the Wisdom Keepers. Many years ago, I got this book in my old favorite place, which is now gone, Building 19. <laughs> building 19. I got this song and a dance, but it was awesome. I started reading this and I didn't want to put it down. I gave the course in, in the fall, and when it was over, it was a 12 hour course, two hours each week for six weeks. And at the end of it, I guess the women liked it, they were supposed to have. 15 maximum in the class. I had 24, 24. I had to bring my own folding table every week because they didn't come up with another table for me for the women to sit at. So at the end of the, the course, this is what they did. I don't know where they got this, but it's awesome. Oh. <laughs> oh, like this? Yeah, I love it. That is awesome. Did you see it? Oh, you saw this before. On the left-hand side is Chief Joseph. And then we have Sitting Bull. And then we have Geronimo. Geronimo. And the last one way over on the right is Red Cloud. And Red Cloud was the one who defeated Custa. Uh, so I thought this was a great <laughs> presence to get. And it looks huge, but it fits. <laughs> it fits. <coughs> I guess I'm a little bigger than I thought I was. I said, that was pretty neat, the way they put this in the background. Mount Rushmore and these people. Wow. 
All right. I have my trusty book because uh, my forgetter is getting better than my rememberer. I gotta remember that too. All right, at the beginning of this, this is ridiculous for me to just put this in my own words because this is better. It's from these elders. Two men, one was a photographer and one was a, uh, did documentaries for National Geographic. They just went out on a, on a lock and they were trying to come up with a story and the book, this book is a result of what they found. They have 17 interviews with 17 elders of the different tribes in the United States. And they all had some very good things to say and some of them warned us. They certainly warned us because we're not doing a great job anymore with our universe. We're letting it go. This comes from 1000 AD, 1000. <clears throat> Think not forever of yourselves, O cheats, nor of your own generation. Think of continuing generations of our families. Think of our grandchildren and of those yet unborn whose faces are coming from beneath the ground. That's what they always said, they're coming from beneath the ground, the next generation, the seventh generation, over and over. These are the words spoken by the great peacemaker, that was his name, peacemaker. He was the founder of the Iroquois Confederation, and this is about 1000 AD. They've been around for a long time, a long time. These two men, uh, they just set out but boy, did they have a great time. Just off the map beyond the interstates, out past the power lines and the shopping malls, up that little side road without a sign on it, lies the land of the wisdom keepers. Hidden from the mainstream of contemporary life, these living treasures are traditional Native American are revered among their people as the elders, the old ones the grandfathers and the grandmothers. The fragile repositories of ancient ways and sacred knowledge going back millenniums. They don't preserve it, they live it. We knew little about such things when the man we now call the gatekeeper approached us in late 1981. We were in Western North Carolina working on an unrelated magazine article and found ourselves talking to a local landowner in his horse pasture one afternoon. We just asked him if he knew any interesting local characters for the article, and he mentioned an Indian, a Cherokee medicine man, whom he thought we might find interesting. Even as he was speaking, the Cherokee slid his battered blue pickup to a halt in front of us. He emerged from the billowing dust and with surprising nimbleness for a full-bellied man, vaulted the barbed wire fence to present his outstretched hand in greeting. At first, in spite of his smiles and outward good humor, there seemed something vaguely menacing about him. His, his smile had a way of fading suddenly, <clears throat> revealing an underlying expression that was half angry, half sad. Not much was said at that first meeting. We found ourselves avoiding his eyes. <clears throat> Drawing back, we exchanged pleasantries and we said goodbye, not expecting to ever see him again. But then, wherever we went, over the next few days, it seemed he was already there, or would turn up shortly after we had arrived, always friendly, always ready to talk. His appearances were uncanny. Eventually, we got over our inhibitions, our inner uncertainties. This man wasn't looking for small talk. He had something on his mind, and in some unfathomable way, we two unlikely white journalists had something to do with it. What was bothering him 
finally surfaced. He was a middle-level medicine man, primarily a <coughs> herbalist. He had studied with two famous modern medicine men, Amanita Wolf Sequoia of the Cherokee <coughs> and Josie Billy of the Seminole. Both, alas, had died in recent months. He recalled that Amanita, just before his death, had invited him to become a disciple so he could pass on everything he knew. But feeling inadequate, he had declined. When Amanita abruptly died, the gatekeeper was swept by a wave of remorse. As a kind of penance, he took it upon himself to make a journey, a spirit journey, to the grandfathers and the grandmothers of other Indian nations around the country. He would sit at their knees and learn from them whatever they cared to share. The grandfathers are dying out, he said, and the old way is going with them. Someone has to go out to them, record their words, take their photographs, otherwise it will be all lost. I'm no photographer or writer, he said. I believe you two guys have been chosen to do it. <coughs> and that's how they began. They thought he was going to lead them from place to place, but that's not the way it turned out. He said he's not the guy to take them everywhere. He's just getting them on their way. So they went to all of these tribes, the Lakota, the Iroquois, Seminole, Ojibwe, Hopi, Ute, Pawnee, Shinnecock, Ho, Lumbee, and others. We have met them on their sacred soil, entered their homes and lives and discovered the infinite riches of their friendships. Not being Indian experts may have been our greatest strength. Had we been anthropologists or sociologists, or heaven help us, ethno-historians, we would likely have been thrown out on our ears more than a few times. We asked for no secrets, only for what they cared to share with us. Quite beyond our expectations, they revealed their inmost thoughts and feelings, their dreams and their visions, their healing remedies and apocalyptic prophecies. Oh, some of these prophecies, they're already coming to pass. What began as a journalistic project became a mission for the two of us. They received special gifts from all of these elders. And then at the end it says, the grandfathers and the grandmothers are in the children whose faces are coming from beneath the ground. We are changed. We have been seized and shaken. We went out to journalists after a good story. We came back to runners from another world, carrying an urgent message from the wisdom keepers. Now, I'm not certainly going to not do this whole book. I'm just going to do a little bit. But some of these are really funny, and some are very, very serious. This fellow didn't want to show his face. He's more interested in the watermelon. Charlie Knight, he was a Ute. Out on the high desert plain of southwestern Colorado, Ute medicine man Charlie Knight sits at the open door of his shiny blue Chevy pickup. Not in a tent, a pickup. Eyeing the two approaching strangers whose dusty renter car has just pulled up to his little one-man aluminum trailer. Tucked away behind a low rust-red mesa, the trailer, a cubbyhole on wheels, sits in an almost inconceivably vast amphitheater of stony desert with bizarre shafts of frozen rock rising up here and there against the tilting horizon. We've seen pictures of these beautiful, beautiful scenery out there. To the west of the massive of horizontal sleeping Ute Mountain <coughs> lies prone at the foot of the color streaked late afternoon sky. This fellow is quite a character. 
Once legend says, all Utes were giants. A hunting party of these Ute giants left the lone brave behind to stand sentry over the land until they returned. Centuries passed, and the giant sentry at last fell asleep. At this, the creator became angry and reduced all Utes to normal human size, except the sleeping sentry, who was transformed into a mountain to stand eternal God over the land. It said that one day the giant sleeping Ute will rise up from the earth and come to the rescue of his people in a time of great danger. Not many white men turn up out here at Charlie's sheep camp. The two-lane blacktop goes by about a mile away, and it's easy to miss the weed-grown dirt rut of a road that turns off at a sagging barbed wire fence a dozen miles south of Cortez, the nearest town. Three dogs howl our arrival, and they slink behind the truck. Their hackles are raised, awaiting a cue from Charlie on how to react to these two strangers. His first words are, when you leaving? <laughs> when you leaving? <clears throat> he smiles ever so lightly. Eyes unfathomable behind dark tinted metal rimmed sunglasses. We explain why we've come. We'd like to share with him a few hours, days, even weeks to record his words, take some photographs, and bring back to the outside world any message or messages he might like to transmit. Charlie snorts and shakes his head. When did you fellows say you're leaving? We take no insult. There's no venom in his words. We even sense a certain rough and easy friendliness in the low, guttural tones of his voice. <coughs> he speaks slowly, wrestling with his seldom used English. How do you know where to find Charlie? A Cheyenne Sioux named Bob White had given us his name, and given us the name of his daughter Judy. Charlie winces at the words medicine man. He tell you I'm a medicine man? How's he know? Charlie's no medicine man. Charlie does a little medicine, that's all. Maybe you got the wrong Charlie. Yep, yeah, that's who you got, the wrong Charlie. He wheezes out a short, loud laugh, enjoying his own joke. Better go now, you two. Charlie's got to get up early tomorrow. Got to catch me a wild bull up the mountain. That's me, wild bull Charlie. Not medicine man, Charlie. You fellas got the wrong Charlie. All of a sudden, he's dead serious. He studies us through the sunglasses. Maybe you come again, but now you better go. No good Two fellows like you be wandering around here after dark. Things can happen out here at night. Stick people could be out. He grins. You got the wrong Charlie, he says. <coughs> he yells as we drive off. We hang around for a few days, and he's always back to the same thing. You got the wrong Charlie, and the stick people are out. You better leave. The stick people. There's a long silence. He pivots around and he peers at us through his sunglasses. This goes on for days and days and days. And they, they don't get too much out of him. But they do get one thing. He takes out a tape recorder and he tapes a song for them. It plays and he says, this is my song. This is what the Creator has given me. You have a song. Everyone has a song. But you have to know your song to be saved. And the Creator gives you his song. So he plays his song for these two. And then he says, 
he lights a match and he starts a little flame with some logs. He said, this clears the house of wanted, unwanted spirits. It's cedar, and cedar gets rid of the spirits. Charlie stands before the fire. He prays aloud in mute for several minutes. Smoke keeps stick people away. I think they're looking for you too. Last night we seen them right out there behind the house like big dogs walking on their back legs like this. And then he raises his arms and he struts around like a stick person. Then he laughs and sits back down, yawning. <coughs> when you're leaving, he says that over and over. Finally, they do leave. But when they leave, they're a little bit nervous about the stick people. So they don't want to be out there in the dark. Now this, this is Frank Fool's Crow. And this <coughs> fellow, this is a great story because it's about something we know about. We all do. An incident at Wounded Knee. It's February 27th, 1983. And we're among several hundred celebrants attending the 10th anniversary of the occupation. Do you remember that? The occupation at Wounded Knee. There was a tribal takeover at the little reservation. The ensuing 73-day siege by U.S. Marshals and the FBI left two Indians and an FBI man dead, and many of the organizers in prison or on the run. This probably brings a little bit back. I remember this that it took place by design here at Wounded Knee, where U.S. troops using rapid-fire Hotchkiss cannon massacred some 250 Lakota men, women, and children in 1890. Has made this site doubly tragic, doubly holy. Something strange happens here. 10 years after the siege, the celebrants have marched out here from the four directions. The American Indians always said that. We come from the four directions. And they didn't like to be called Native Americans. One of the chiefs said, we're not Native American. Anyone born in this country is a Native American. We're American Indians. They do not want to be called Native Americans. They converged at the hill's crest, gathering shoulder to shoulder in a memorial service for those killed in 1890 and in 1973. And then you heard them. It goes on four times. Four times the eagle bone whistle blows from the haunted hill of wounded knee. Four times in each of the sacred four directions. The frail, eerie squeal of the whistle lifts into the high, empty, chill blue South Dakota sky. As the shrill cry of the whistle penetrates the silence, the hushed crowd huddles together, heads bowed in prayer. A restless wind whips around the pungent smoke from the burning white sage presented moments before to the Creator. Again and again, the whistle screeching pierces the air, each blast catching the wind and floating over the vast plain. With the crowd's watchful eyes focused upon him, the 93-year-old Lakota ceremonial chief and spiritual elder, Frank Fool's Crow, lifts high his smoking medicine pipe, the symbolic of the, original, of the original pipe brought by the white buffalo calf woman. He points its blue feathered mouthpiece first to the four directions, then down to Grandmother Earth, then up to Grandfather Sky. His prayer in the Lakota language mingles on the air with the wafting incense of the sage and the lingering after echo of the eagle bone whistle. 
In plaintive tones, he implores the creator for a sign. I want a sign. <coughs> he wants the sign that he, the creator, still hears them, that he still remembers and loves his Indian children. A hollow wind wails hoarsely above our heads like a distant chorus of muffled voices, as if the still undeparted spirits of wounded knee are added to their ghostly supplications. There's a huge cemetery out there with all those who were massacred. At the fool's crow's moving words, the drummers raise a musical prayer into the wind. Soon the crowd begins to murmur. Heads tilt back and fingers point skyward. The chanting and the singing stop quickly. People nudge each other in awe. They're all looking up. Look, look up in the sky, someone cries. Our eyes raise skyward with the others, and there, perhaps a thousand feet above our heads, circling, circling on outstretched wings, the only thing visible in all that colossal blue dome of sky, one eagle. To the American Indians, an eagle was a great, great symbol. Now you see the power of wounded knee, <coughs> a voice shouts out. For fully ten minutes, the great bird, witness of the creator, hovers over the sacred hill of wounded knee. Then, before tears can be wiped from wondering eyes, it suddenly flies off and almost instantly disappears. Gone from whence it came. The elder thanks the creator for recognizing the people once again by sending, as he has so often done before, the sign of his power and love. Now to these people at Wounded Knee, that was a significant symbol. One eagle comes out, coming out of nowhere, circling around for about 10 minutes and then gone. They believe in the creator and they, that's why they treated everything properly, unlike the way we have treated our universe and continue to do so. This one, I'm not only going to read some parts of this, and I know well, you only have a certain amount of time, but this one is Matthew King. He's a Lakota chief, Matthew King. And boy, does he have some prophecy. He doesn't like what the white man has done. He's the Lakota chief. He said, don't call us Sioux. That's the American name for us. We are Lakota, not Sioux. Now, we've probably heard Sioux a lot more than we've ever heard Lakota. <coughs> All right. He comes out, and he is upset. He waves his hand when we try to explain why we're here. I know why you're here, he says. White man came to this country and forgot his original instructions. We have never forgotten our instructions. So you're here looking for the instructions you lost. I can't tell you what those were, but maybe there are some things I can explain. It's time Indians told the world what we know about nature and about God. So I'm going to tell you what I know and who I am. You guys better listen. You've got a lot to learn. He leans forward in his chair and he looks into us, right through us. I'm an Indian. I'm one of God's children. My Indian name is Noble Red Man. That was my grandfather's name. I'm a chief. I say what I have to say. That's my duty. If I don't say it, who's going to say it for me? I'm a prophet of the Indian people. I can see what's coming. I prophesy what's going to happen. I can look right into your eyes and heart 
and see if you're lying or trying to cheat me. I can see if you mean harm to the Indian people. Call me a chief of the Lakota. I'm a speaker for the chiefs. I walk with the great spirit, with God. I talk to him. The great spirit guides me in my life. Sometimes he comes to me and tells me what to say. Other times, I just speak for myself, for Matthew King. I've got Red Cloud's peace pipe. Red Cloud, the one who defeated Custer. <clears throat> I have his peace pipe. They gave me that when they made me the chief. I wouldn't accept it in the beginning. Red Cloud was a great man. He made all those treaties. He fought when he had to, and he beat the white man soldiers. Wiped Custer out. Red Cloud had a lot of powers, but I'd rather solve my problems through peace. I also have Black Bear's pipe and Noble Red Man's pipe. The peace pipe is our only weapon. It's our holy power. It's God's power. The pipe mediates between man and God. To receive the pipe, to receive God's gift, You've got to be pure in heart, mind, body, and soul. And never, ever forget that after the prayers, you've got to live that life, a life with God. That's the hardest part. He said, God made everything so simple. Our lives are very simple. We do what we please. The only law we obey is the natural law, God's law. We abide only by that. We don't need your church. We have the Black Hills for our church, and we don't need your Bible. We have the wind and the rain and the stars for our Bible. The world is an open Bible for us. We Indians have studied it for millions and millions of years. We've learned that God rules the universe and that everything God made is living. Even the rocks are alive. When we use them in our sweat ceremony, we talk to the rocks, and they talk back to us. I just want to get to the important part right here. White man gets everything wrong. This is according to this chief. He says we're warlike when we're peaceful. He calls us savages. But the white man is the savage. See, he calls this headdress a war bonnet. Sure, we used it in war, but most of the time it's just for ceremonies, not war. Each feather stands for good deed, and I have 36 in my war bonnet. It's not about war, it's about who we are. When we sing songs, we call them war songs. But they're not war songs, they're prayers to God. We have drums, so white man calls them war drums. But they're not for war, they're for talking to God. There's no such thing as a war drum. He sees our warriors paint their faces, so he calls it war paint. But it's not for war, it's to make it so God can see our faces clearly if we have to die. So how can we talk to the white man of peace when he only knows about war? Indian religion is as old as the creator. In our way of life, the elders give spiritual direction. The wisdom of thousands of years flows through our lips, the wisdom keepers. Others want to learn what our elders knew. They find some carnival chief who'll give them a sweat bath for $250. <clears throat> and then they think they know all about the Indian religion. But you don't sell the religion of your people. Our ceremonies are our religion, and our religion are not for sale. And we're not selling the Black Hills either. 
The white man wants us to take a hundred million dollars for our black hills. But a hundred billion wouldn't be enough. Not four hundred billion. That wouldn't even pay for the damages you have done. You can never pay us for what you've stolen and destroyed. You can never pay for all the eagles you've killed, or all the buffalo, all the wild game. No, and you can never pay us for all the Indians you've killed. The Black Hills aren't for sale. The Black Hills are where we came out of the earth, where our ancestors are buried where we go for sacred ceremonies. They are the birthplace of the Lakota people. What if we offered you a hundred million dollars for the Vatican? That's a strange word to say. You think it's an accident that you drove us back into these hills and badlands? Only to find out that this land was rich with gold and copper and coal and uranium? Now you want the uranium, but you can't have it. We are the guardians of the uranium of gr Grandmother Earth. You can't have it. You'll only use it to destroy God's world. How prophetic. You have taken everything and you've given us nothing. But worst of all, you have never even thanked us. You've got to change your ways. I don't have to change. You're the ones who have to change. I live by God's power, and I do what he wants me to do. We Indians live the good life, a happy life, until you came here and made it miserable. Who gave you the right to do that? You killed our people. You killed our chiefs. You stole our land, but God gave us this land. You can't take it away. Matthew rises from his chair. There's fire in his eyes. His words burn and smoke like brimstone. When he spits out the word you, he doesn't mean some abstract white man. He means the two of us standing here before him. We are the oppressors, the destroyers, the murderers. We are the enemy. And then he makes this prophecy, and then I'll end. I prophesy many things that come to pass. God is going to put a judgment on the world. He's mad. I'm sorry it's going to happen. He's not going to destroy the whole world, but every living thing will perish. And it'll be maybe, maybe another million years before a new life begins again here. Grandmother Earth will be alone. She's going to rest, all because of white man's wickedness. You're going to fall, and you're going to fall hard. You're going to be crying and wailing. You'll realize you can't get away with destroying God's world. Don't think you can get away with it. God's going to wipe the wickedness from the earth. He can, you can see his signs out on the west coast, Mount St. Helens, volcano, that's a sign. And there's going to be earthquakes. Maybe half of California and half of Washington and Oregon will go into the water. <clears throat> the same in the east and in the south. You're going to have volcanoes and earthquakes and droughts and hurricanes. And it seems to be getting worse. <laughs> Matthew stood before us waving his arms like two great eagle wings, tossing up tempests below. It's God giving signs to the white man, punishing him for not paying his debt to the Indian people, for destroying the land with his greed. And it will get worse until you pay us what you owe us what you promised us until you give us what is ours. You are going to learn the most important lesson, that God is the most powerful thing there is. We Indians aren't afraid to die. We've got a place to go. 
a better place. So we don't care. We're ready. We just want you to know, maybe you can change. Maybe you can stop what's coming. There's not much time. It's going to happen. Take it from me. Tell them, noble red man said so. That was his message to the two people. The book is filled with wonderful stories, but uh, some of them are funny, some of them are very, very serious. But these two men who set out on a mission, they accomplished a great deal. It's a great book. If anyone is interested, I even brought the, the information for getting the book. It's a, I did this for the women's tea, too. And some of the women came up afterwards and I said, I'd like to get this book. Where can I get the book? Because some of the wisdom keepers were women. They weren't all men. The women ran the show. We forget that. The women ran the villages. They still do. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Oh, that's on camera. Oh, and I said it. Oh, my mother. Oh, my mother's listening, and my wife is going to hear that. Oh, I'm in trouble now. Well, I, I go over this book quite often. I keep it by my bed, just like Robert Frost poetry. Yes. It's a joke. You know why Havel's so clean? A little joke. Pan and Dustin. <laughs> Pan and Dustin. Ah, that's a good one. Okay. Yeah. One question. Uh, the Indians, uh, think back, how did the, <clears throat> the Indians originally came from China along the Bering Strait in Alaska? Has, is that how they settled in here? That's what all historians believe. Okay. Indians do not, Indian males do not have body hair. Indian males do not have body hair. Not have body hair. You can check with the medical profession. If you ever look at some of the movies, the Indians are riding the horses, they had no hair in the chest. They had plenty of them. A few, not here. Yeah, but no, they had no. Are they Maybe when they No, the reason why. <laughs> Maybe when they were com coming across the Bell Street, it all froze and fell off. I don't know what happened. I don't know what that is. Yeah, the reason why is. Uh, my grandfather came from Canada, Quebec. And number one, when I went in the service, I had my physical. The doctor when he gave me my physical for the military. He says, you got Indian blood in you. I said, yeah. He said, well, how do you know? He says, the Indians are not had body here. And I traced my forefathers. My mother was at the son of the founder of Lee B, which is a city across from Quebec. Oh. 1948, my mother was the last living descendant of the founder of that town, and we went up there. I was only a kid. We were guests of the town for two weeks, and they chiseled my mother's name at the bottom of the you know, statue of his age, the previous founder of the town. He married an Indian girl. So, this is the book that you should read. <laughs> also, Custa didn't want to conquer the Indians in that area. But the railroads were coming through. They were coming through. So he had a job he had to do. Had to do. I really am grateful that they gave me this because it has a lot of meaning to it. It's really nice. Uh, so I hope you uh, got a little bit. Uh, my course ran for 12 hours. You know, I, I'm certainly not going to keep you here till tomorrow. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Remember, there's still time. There's still time.